It's always a pleasure to speak to my fellow film critics uh, about the year in film, this year being 2023. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to Peter Malone, uh, who is part of the Catholic Film Office. Peter, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Peter, thank you very much. After all these years, we've been doing it. That is absolutely true, and we uh, always find interesting talking about films each year. And uh, so tell me, first of all, before we get to your list, general reaction. How have you found um, the year in cinema? Are people going back to cinemas? Are you uh, finding good films to be able to review and so on? I'll answer the second question first. I'm finding good films to review. In fact, I'm a bit surprised looking through the year. Um, I responded very happily to a whole lot of titles. So that was a pleasure. As regards people going, I'll give you an example. I went to see Wonka last Saturday afternoon at 3.30. Ten of us there oh. and no children. Oh. So I, di I didn't understand that. But in a sense, I suppose that's what happens. And it depends, really. I've got three multiplexes near me. Um, I look one of the youngest at Baldwin generally. Uh, and I should confess I'm not as young as I used to be. Uh, the Rivoli is a mixture. And the Lido, sometimes you see a lot of people there and other times not so many. Mm -hmm. So I find it very hard to tell. For instance, I went to see, before it went on to Netflix, Leave the World Behind mm. at the Jam Factory three of us. So I don't know what to make of that. Yeah. <laughs> Probably a lot of people were expecting it to be on Netflix the week after or something like that because it's well, a Netflix and film. in fact it was. Yeah. In fact it was. Yeah. But I went to see Maestro actually in the cinema. Yeah. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, there were more people there at the Lido. So unpredictable. It is. And it's interesting to note, I mean, Palace are investing in hardtop cinemas. They've, I was at the the new uh, cinemas in uh, Mooney Ponds last night. The, uh, um, uh, what do they call it? can't remember what they called it. But uh, it's 11 screens uh, and a oh. rooftop and uh, uh, excellent quality um, projection sound, etc. And the 11 cinemas range from 40 to 120 seats. Um, so it's a bit like Pentridge in t uh, the cinemas there. Uh, Penny Lane are the name of the cinemas, and it's uh, in Mooney Pond. So it, it's uh, and the Nova is expanding, as you know, to six screens uh, in East Brunswick. Now that I didn't know, so oh, I didn't know about Mooney Ponds either. Oh, I live okay. a sheltered life. <laughs> Well, I mean, there hasn't been any major press releases and so on. It's just that I, I sort of talk to uh, the various uh, cinema owners uh, from time to time and uh, Christian filled me in on FOMO, which is what they're calling the six cinemas in uh, East Brunswick that are part of Nova, even though they're separate and um, they, they'll all be gold-class type um, cinemas and food uh, is on top of the standard admission price uh, for the cinemas, so they don't inflate the cinema uh, ticket. Well, now, I did go to the Nova to the press preview of Poor Things. Yes. And it was crowded. That's yes. true. So Saturday night is not a night I usually go out, but <laughs> say I offered it, and I was curious to see Poor Things. Yep. And, again, the age range of the audience was quite wide. So I suppose if you look at the Nova, then you get some indication that there is a lot of popularity still of going to the movies. Well, every time I'm at the Nova, I actually see lots of people milling around. I mean, I suppose it helps if you've got 16 screens, but uh, <laughs> but it's it, it's very popular, yeah. I'd say the Baldwin, where I go, yep. uh, it's got facilities for coffee and things like that, and I think it appeals to the... I suppose the older population living in that part of Melbourne. Yeah. And they do go there, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's one of the uh, the raft of palace cinemas. So, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, it's good that uh, cinema owners still see value in cinemas rather than giving up and uh, 
uh, selling properties and uh, saying, well, go to streaming. That's much easier. Well, nothing beats the cinema experience. True. <laughs> well, I've been, going a lot, I've been yeah. going a lot longer than you have. You have. I acknowledge that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Peter, uh, always great to hear your best films of the year. So over to you. Go for it. I haven't got them in any particular order. I was looking month by month. Yep. So, um, but I, I will start with poor things because I was surprised how interesting I found it, how well done it was in a different kind of way. And I suppose I'd say I've never seen anything quite like it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I've seen The Lobster and Killing of the Sacred Deer. Yep. But somehow, the, um, and I noticed, by the way, he had a long career in music videos, Yorgos Lanthimos. So the technical side of poor things, angles, lenses and editing, added to a, a very strange experience. So I decided I needed a line to summarise what on earth it meant. So I decided an allegorical odyssey about life development. Sounds so, good. <laughs> oh, well, thanks for that. Now I'm, I'm really confident. I like I mean, that. The, yeah. the, the, I was trying to get a grasp on it as we went through, and as yeah. we saw Emma Stone's extraordinary performance, yes. it must have been very game to do that, really, Yes, in all kinds of ways. Yes. I mean, even the literal exposure, but to move with all those moods and to be a, an inarticulate child in an adult body then to be a tantrum child, uh, smashing things, gradually learning words, gradually adolescent, sensuality, sexuality, and then not yet the moral framework for a life, but a curiosity. And especially when she saw those poor children in Alexandria, mm. somehow or other clicking that there is more to life than just sailing through or is what she called furious jumping <laughs> and that's all kinds of experiences so that by the end odd as it was i thought we'd seen the development of a human being in an interesting kind of way so just on that level let alone uh the multi-starred reconstructed face of william daffo <laughs> as dr frankenstein equivalent and that whole theme there, that she was, uh, uh, well, it was 1895 and they mentioned the importance of being earnest. So it was really a 19th century mm. story. Frankenstein at the beginning, uh, Bella at the end of the 19th century. So, yes, I, I thought there were so many interesting things in it and so differently done. It was. I mean, it was almost, for me, it felt like a Chaucerian journey um, of uh, of finding meaning in life, um, uh, spending a lot of time understanding what it, what is it, what does it all mean? And uh, eventually she sort of found an epiphany of some sort. What a pity I've put all mine in print. I could have stolen Chaucerian Odyssey as well. <laughs> Oh, look, it doesn't matter. It, it is a, a terrific film. I, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, and we should also mention Mark Ruffalo, who in some sense was cast against type, and I think he did it well. Yes, he was a peculiar, unlikable character, a foppish buffoon, I suppose, <laughs> yeah. uh, which he did very well. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and a lot of the supporting cast I found uh, very interesting. Yeah. A bit of name-dropping. There was a sequence there with an actress whom I've met in real life. And? Hannah Shigaila. Ah, Hannah Shigaila. Ah, wonderful. Yes, I recognised her immediately. Yeah. Yes, I'd met her some years ago at, at a festival and ah. as we meet sometimes for these people. So, again, she was um, quite striking in that particular stage of um, Bella learning to read and appreciate reading. Yes. And then the cynical American Harry Jared Carmichael, who's I've seen usually in comic form, being very cynically serious about that stage of her development. Yeah. Oh, no, I 
sometime later, I, I think I will look at it again. <laughs> okay, so poor things uh, 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 is on your list as one of the best films of the year. Let's keep going. Well, I was feeling slightly guilty because I'd thought Killers of the Flower Moon had so many things going for it, which it does, and then suddenly there's poor things. But with Killers of the Flower Moon, in a sense it was a bit guilt-inducing in terms of Scorsese and the writer of the novel and the whole thrust of recognition and exploitation of First Nations people. And since it touches us, and I saw it at the time of the referendum, so I suppose there was that consciousness that I had. And I thought it was so well done uh, and absorbing and very serious. But could I mention, I found Leonardo DiCaprio's character absolutely baffling. <laughs> I mean, he, was, he, he wasn't, I, I heard a phrase recently, um, he doesn't stop at every floor in the elevator, which I thought was a different way of putting it. So, but he, he and, and in a sense, he was earnest in his work during the war, but that he should believe that evilly smiling uncle of his, Robert De Niro, and believe everything, and so treat Lily Gladstone in her wonderful performance. Um, he did mention money a lot, so I presume we were reminded that there was that mixed motivation. And so it wasn't easy watching. Mm. It was so well done. And for De Niro's uncle, priding himself on being, you know, the patron of the town and then working male malevolently against it, mm. poor old Leonardo. And, uh, and then it was interesting when... Um, uh, the FBI came in, and even Brendan Fraser turned up for the court case. Yeah. So there were a whole lot of arresting things and arresting themes all the way through. And this is a bit personal, but I have to say, I didn't have to go out of the cinema during the whole three and a half hours. Ooh. Wow. So <laughs> I was very pleased. I, it got my absolutely full attention. Yeah. So uh, that's yeah. on the list. Absolutely. Well, for me, I, it was my number one film of the year, and 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 the, and the metaphor uh, that it tells us about uh, the more subtle infiltration of white man to indigenous communities and the impact that they had, rather than the usual shoot 'em ups and all that sort of thing, um, I think was done brilliantly. So uh, yeah, yeah, I, I thought it was a great film. Yeah, just came to mind. Some of those themes are there in the Drover's Wife. Ah, and I'm very conscious it was set up in the snowy mountains, and some of my ancestors <clears throat> came from the southern gold fields. So I was thinking, what was their experience? My grandparents, great grandparents, in our rather minute Australian way, compared with American First Nations. So mm. it was touching me in that way as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely understand. All right, uh, a, a very worthy addition to your list. Let's keep going. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to put Maestro on the list, but as I watched it and as I thought about it, I was very impressed while watching it and have been very impressed thinking about it afterwards and all tribute to Bradley Cooper mm. for all the energy that he put into it over some years and it's up there on the screen so that we can actually see and hear it. So, uh, yes, I put Maestro on the list. Absolutely. That final sequence in the, uh, is it Cathedral? Um, yeah, uh, Ely Cathedral. Yes, and uh, that whole, he prepared so well for that, and it was all done in one take uh, as he conducted that orchestra. And that's what I was thinking. I don't know who's going to get the Oscar for Best Actor, but I hope he'll be up there amongst the top contenders. Yes. But the fact that he could not only co-write and direct the film, but those sequences of conducting of Beethoven, but especially in, of Mahler, Mahler's Resurrection, it was, you know, one of those just stop, gasp and admire sequences. Hmm. 
And then the fact of uh, his ageing and the makeup mm. from uh, youthful and then middle age and then old age, all that kind of thing, um, I found it quite extraordinary. And then again, techniques, the black and white, then going into the colour uh, and the performance of Kerry Mulligan mm. again. Um, I found it interesting, of course, Leonard Bernstein, for us Philistines, I'm not including you, <laughs> I mean me, Philistines, uh, his West Side Story, of course. Yeah. And I found it very interesting, just only a brief reference that he was working on it. And also the opening was there in one of the very tense scenes where he arrives by car at the home. Yeah. And I thought, oh, oh, that's West Side Story's opening. So, and then there was a lot of Candide during the final credits. Yes. So there was his composition but there was definitely his conducting. And I was impressed when they told us about his um, teaching on television sequences for so many years. Mm. So I was glad to know that as one of the mus American musicians of last century. I knew about the sexual orientation and behaviour, but I really wasn't aware of the marriage. And I did find that very interesting. And um, his ability then to respond to his wife children, as well as those affairs with the uh, music musicians. Yes. A lot in it, I thought. Absolutely. The The only thing that surprised me was uh, with Bernstein's music, which is only used in the film, there's no other compositions or other musicians, uh, uh, other other sound, uh, uh, other scores uh, in the film, is that they tended to downplay, as you said, West Side Story, On the Waterfront, the score he composed for that, and some other films that he, uh, and uh, other stage productions he was involved with. I thought maybe the, the focus on the romance or the marriage was a little bit too much, but nevertheless, it was a, it was an uh, excellent film, yeah. I had the on the town references early in the film. Yes. In the ballet. But I thought, well, it's not a biography, it's a portrait. Yes. And there can be many portraits yes. of uh, people like that. And his creativity. Absolutely. And his feet of clay. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, we need to keep moving. So what's next on your list? Well, it's not next on the list, but I was thinking feet of clay. So I'm going to mention Napoleon. Okay. I I was very taken by the screenplay of Napoleon. I thought it was a very interesting, different, eccentric exploration of Napoleon's character. And I was thinking of it, I'd just done some work with Jung's personality types. And the way that I thought Napoleon was being portrayed was not as the field marshal commanding general, but rather as a military man, a tactician, and after all, he did fail several times. Mm. Think Moscow, think Waterloo. So it's not as if he's absolutely commanding. And he was humorless, fairly unimaginative, and that was demonstrated in his relationship with Josephine. Now, whether that's an accurate portrait of him, I found it very interesting as an exploration of him in the spectacular, I saw it on IMAX, on the spectacular screen with all the battles and the costumes decor and the whole atmosphere from the execution of Marie Antoinette till his exile in St Helena. So I found it one of the very interesting films of the year for me anyway. Okay. Okay. I, I won't, in, uh, I, uh, personally, I didn't like the film. I thought there were too many things that uh, I didn't like about the characterization of Napoleon and the relationship in particular. And I also didn't like the historical errors um, that um, were put into the film, even though he had uh, a consultant who uh, told him uh, all about the, the history of Napoleon, and he then he uh, ignored it and went with, I mean, that opening scene about the execution of uh, Marie Antoinette, he was not there. No. Yeah. No, that's, that's drama. Yeah, that's drama. I know, I know, but, yeah. Anyway, but, okay, no, that's fine. I, I'm, uh, I'm glad you liked the film. <laughs> Speaking of portraits of geniuses. Yep. We better have Oppenheimer, of course. I found it three films in one, really. Mm. That I, I enjoyed all the establishing hour, 
of who he was and where he came from, yep. science background. I enjoyed uh, Los Alamos and all that preparation of the bomb. But I actually found very interesting the last hour and the mm. aftermath, which I see some people writing off saying it was boring, that obviously the dropping of the bomb was for them the climax of the story. Yeah. Whereas his aftermath, the American aftermath, and I'd give Robert Downey Jr. the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor <laughs> for his performance in it. I thought he was terrific. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I thought there was such a lot in Oppenheimer. I was glad that I... I saw it. Yes, I fully agree. Excellent film, and uh, um, and yes, the the whole McCarthy period and the uh, the guilt that was imposed on him for the uh, the scientific discoveries that he'd made that was used in a particular way by the American government. Of course, um, I thought that was all quite fascinating. Well, even just with the films I've mentioned so far, it's been quite a significant year. Mm. I would think. Um, I'd better mention Barbie. I'm not sure she'd be on the top ten, but I actually did enjoy it very yeah. much. And I thought the attack on the Kens was really <laughs> marvellous. <laughs> Extraordinary. <laughs> Extraordinary. We'll see how it fares in awards, but, I mean, it's had its own reward in everybody going to see it. Yes. And I'm sure Margot Robbie, when there's a kind of Salvation Army appeal, might have a dollar or two that she could hand out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we've mentioned it, but I, yes. I, I did enjoy it. And I thought America Ferrara's speech, yep. which I actually downloaded from Google, so I've got it there, ah. it was shorter than I thought, but I thought it really was very powerful about men and especially about women. Hmm. And with Rhea Perlman as the inventor of Barbie at the end, I thought with all the satire and all the fun, there's a lot of depth actually there for those who want to hear it. Yes, I absolutely agree. I was surprised how good the film was, uh, uh, starting with the opening sequence, which was a, a lovely send-up of 2001, A Space Odyssey. Yes, yes, <laughs> very much. And I'm, I'm so glad that Greta Gerwig has been rewarded by being head of the international jury at Cannes next year. Has she? I hadn't heard that. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's fantastic. Uh, yep, so that's Barbie. All right. At first, when I heard about that film coming up, I thought it was about Klaus Barbie. Thank goodness it wasn't. Oh. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> well, we've had that, haven't we? I seem to remember one with Michael Caine. I've forgotten the name of it now, by Norman Jewison. But anyhow, back to oh. Klaus Barbie. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's the not going to come to mind. Sta the statement. The statement. Well done. Yeah. Good one. Okay. All right. Now, some more now, films on your best list. Now, this is just a mixture. I better acknowledge um, Ken Loach, um, if it's his last film. But um, I think it's a worthy ending to such a long career mm. and such a commitment to social justice uh, that I've admired him for decades, had the good opportunity to meet him because, in fact, with all the Catholic uh, juries at f festivals and ecumenical, he is the director who has received the most awards mm -hmm. from those juries. And I'm glad to say that, which means a concern about social justice and the issues. Yes. Although he did tell me that when he got the phone call about land and freedom from the church, he thought he was going to be utterly excommunicated <laughs> and condemned and was shocked to find that he was getting the award. And <laughs> after that, He's done all these films with Paul Laverty, who actually was uh, a seminarian for many years uh -huh. at the Scots College in Rome. Uh -huh. So Paul Laverty, uh, Ken Loach said, he thought the church was monolithic until he worked with Paul Laverty. So, again, there's that kind of background. And, and as he worked in uh, the Old Oak, the visit to um, Durham Cathedral and the Muslim woman hearing that kind of music for the first time and seeing that kind of cathedral. he Whether he says he's religious or not, he's got a sense of the transcendent, and I've found that in his films as well. So just like to pay tribute to Ken Loach and, and the Old Oak. Yep. And paying tribute this time to uh, Nicholas Winton. Ah. Uh, I noticed that SBS are showing Into the Arms of Strangers, yes. which I'd seen 20 years ago. 
So I'd had this awareness of Nicholas Winton and uh, seen the fa the famous scene where he's in this uh, This Is Your Life program and the compere says, anybody, you know, who's benefited from Nicholas Winton, stand up. And they all do. Mm. And I'm glad that's in, that's in this film as well. Yeah. I thought Anthony Hopkins was wonderful as Winton in old age, but I was in great admiration for Johnny Flynn yeah. in such a different performance. I would never have thought of casting him mm. based on other performances, but I thought as Nicholas Winton in, in 1938, he was very, very good. Yeah. And I thought the zest which Helena Bonham Carter brought to his mother in The Crusade. <laughs> so it's a very worthy film. And I find it interesting that the distributors have decided that it's one for Boxing Day. I mean, it's had plenty in advance, but the fact that they would have chosen that. And if there's a Christmas message in the value of a life, then I think that's significant. So that's paying tribute to the British films. Can yep. I suggest an and Italian that's what, one? And I just want to say that title of the film is One Life, and it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Highly, highly recommended. Yes, keep going. I like Caravaggio's Shadow. Ah. Did you? I, I thought it was okay. I, I had a few misgivings about uh, some of the aspects of the story and what it omitted, as well as what it uh, what was in the film. But yeah, no, that's all right. Oh, I enjoyed being taken back to the era, an ugly kind of era in church history. Uh -huh. uh, he a peculiar man. Yeah, uh, I'll give him that. But. I found it intriguing, you know, with his art and with his way of life, uh, especially finding Isabelle Huppert there in the cast it was a surprise. But, um, and I've liked R Ricardo Scamacho in so many films, but it was Louis Garrel and discovering that the title of the film was not Caravaggio, really, but his shadow was the Inquisition yes. following him. So that gave me a whole deeper sense of intrigue mm. in terms of the history of the church at that time. So I actually was caught up in it, and I thought I'll give it a mention as well. Mm. Yeah. No, no, fair enough. I, I, I thought it was good. It was a good film, but uh, uh, I, I think it uh, uh, it papered over some of his background and some of his uh, uh, aspects of his life. But that doesn't matter. That, that's fine. Let's yeah. keep going because I don't want to run out of time. <laughs> well, can I just mention a few quickly? Go for it. I really, I really enjoyed Uproar. It's not ah. necessarily the top ten, but I thought Julian Dennison, despite his increasing girth, which he seems to be comfortable with, yeah, he was so watchable and took me back. Actually, my grandfather came from Dunedin. Ah. Expressed that uh, personal interest, although yeah. I've never been there. But New Zealand, the 1980s, football, apartheid, mm. uh, First Nations, all those themes and a cheery atmosphere as well. So that I liked Uproar. Mm. And another one I saw in the cinema before it went to Netflix was Nyad. And I just have to mention Annette Benning's performance. Yep. I mean, Jodie Foster was pretty good, but I thought Annette Benning, without a, a skerrick of vanity, playing that age mm. and that tough character, I really found I was caught up in the whole story, knowing nothing about her beforehand. Mm. So uh, I wanted to say that. Yes, it was a swimming drama and I found it fascinating. Uh, I really liked it, yes. Now, have you seen El Conde? El Conde. Doesn't ring a bell? Ah, I'm recommending it. It's by Pablo Lorraine. Ah, yes. Chilean. Yeah. It's about it's about Pinochet. No, it, it was that in cinemas, or was that at the uh, Spanish Film Festival? It, it, it's been on Netflix for a couple of months. Oh, right. I haven't seen it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's about Pinochet, ah. and he's a vampire. Ah. So it uses all the genre conventions of the vampire films yeah but it also really illuminates history and his time as uh, before being general yeah and then his rule and then with his children and the financial aftermath so that it's a critique of chilean history recently mm. but it's all in the context and 
a spoiler, uh, another character in the film is called Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. <laughs> I had a so sinking it's feeling. Very, <laughs> it's very, it's very tongue in cheek. Yes. But because he's such an important Chilean director. Yes. I thought it might have got more promotion. But anyhow, if you haven't come across it, you might find that one uh, particularly interesting. And is that two words, El Conde? Yes, the chief, the count. The ch count. Excellent. I'll look count out for it. It sounds great. One spoiler is he became um, he became a vampire back in France in the 18th century. So you go back into that as well. Ah. And it's, in, it's mainly in black and white. Okay. Yes. Sounds good. So quite a quite a striking film. Yes. Um I've got here on my list, I'm just looking quickly, um, past lives, for instance. Yep. I very much like the blue captain. Yeah. I've got a bit of partiality for Iranian films. Yep. And um I really found this uh very, very moving. Yes. And there was the other the other gay film from France about lies. Um, oh, biography. oh, about the author who returns to his hometown. Yeah. Yes, yes, his yes. Hometown. I thought that's very interesting, the um, two films treating that theme in an adult kind of way. Yeah. Non-judgmental, but inviting you to appreciate the characters, their strengths and their failings. Yes. So uh, I, I, I mentioned those. Yes. The other thing... I, I, can I mention this? I rather liked some of the horror films in recent months. Sure. Now, I'm not going to put them on top of the list. Yeah. But I was surprised. I liked Five Nights at Freddy's. It somehow appealed to me. Okay. <laughs> um, those characters. I can't tell whether you liked it or not. My hunch is you're being reserved about your comment about it. So-so is my response. <laughs> the one I really liked was Thanksgiving. Oh yes, I yes. Thought, I thought if you're going to have a slasher movie yeah. with a bit of plot and a bit of um, meaning, and I really empathised with uh, the send up of Black Friday sales. Yes, and the mania as they rush. I mean, I know you got images of Boxing Day sales here. <laughs> yes. Maybe the Australian version of Thanksgiving can be Boxing Day or something like that. Yeah, but I, I thought it did. It worked well. I thought it paced well. I thought the characters were interesting. Yes, no, I certainly didn't pick the murderer at all. No, but that's the value of the film. Yes. So there was that one, and the other one. Since I'm in a confessional way, <laughs> yes, I actually liked Saw Ten. Oh, <laughs> so I don't know what that's saying about me, but um, somehow or other, I was a bit more converted to uh, some of the horror conventions. I thought they were done a bit better at the latter part of 2023 than at other times. Mm, all right, I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make a plug for some small budget Australian films? Yes, you can. We've got five minutes left. The um, did you see Cost? Yes, the Cost. Yes, yes. I spoke to the director. Yes, I thought it was um, really very moving. The Cost. Yes, in the moral issues of revenge. Yep. The other one, in not exactly in a similar vein, but was Christmas. Oh yes. <laughs> I. I was very taken with that. It is very good. Yes, yes, yes. So I, I was surprised. The other one, not so good because it was so much smaller. Was Damage? Oh yes. So yeah. driving Miss Daisy, Australian version. <laughs> yes, the mother of the director, as I read afterwards. Yes, I when famous I spoke to her. Yes, that's right. Yes, famous singer. And uh, anyway, yeah, I believed it was a cantankerous old lady passenger. <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought, isn't it interesting how we we can praise our bigger budget ones and our medium budget films? Yes. Uh, here we have these small ones, and you would hope that more people would be able to see them. Yes. Because they're well made, mm. and in terms of themes, they're they're very interesting. 
I found I was really surprised, for instance, at Christmas. Yes. I found I'd seen the previous films by the director, Heath Davis, and had reviewed them favourably. Yes. Um, his name hadn't stayed in mind, but I really thought um, Christmas had quite a lot to say. So... Um, yes. They're some of the films that I like. Somebody else asked me, is there anything I didn't like? Yes. And this, this is very short. I realised I must be getting old. I didn't like three very raunchy comedies okay. from America this year. Yes. For instance, with Bottoms, <laughs> I felt I was eavesdropping on two 17-year-olds having private conversations and that I shouldn't be listening in. Now, I see people giving it three and four stars, so it yes. obviously appeals to some people. I but, liked it, um, yeah. Anyway, no, be quick with uh, with the other two films because we're almost out of time. The other one was um, Theatre Camp. didn't appeal to me either. Okay. And uh, I really didn't like Joyride. Okay. Sorry about that. Mike, tell me why. Yeah. And and uh, and that was uh, that was the Asian uh, focused film, the the sisters or the uh, the women on the journey yeah, joyride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was um, crazy rich rich Asians in yes. the worst way. So I just <laughs> now I don't know. Does that mean I'm getting old, or I don't know what else? Look, we all have our own different tastes, our, our uh, things that we enjoy, don't enjoy. That's perfectly fine. I uh, understand that. So, yeah. yeah. Look, Peter, a, a really interesting list of films and uh, uh, hopefully I'll see you in the new year at another screening. I know that things are quiet at the moment, but uh, uh, there'll be more films coming up because they've uh, held back so many films because of the uh, writer's strike, uh, the uh, actor strike. Yeah. I've still got to see half a dozen of those that are going to be released on Boxing Day. Ah. So my, my immediate list is quite large. <laughs> Fair enough. Peter Malone, pleasure as always to talk to you. Peter from the Catholic Film Office. And uh, thank you so much for your best films and a few not-so-good ones of the year. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Always a good opportunity to think over the year. Absolutely. All the best, Peter. See you later. Thanks very much. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.